Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to this episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I am excited to introduce you to my guest, Dr. Fiona Marshall. She is currently the VP, Head of Neuroscience Discovery and Head of Discovery UK, Global Head of Neuroscience Discovery Research, leading teams in West Point, Boston, and London at MSD. For those of you who don't know Fiona, she is the co-founder of Heptaris Therapeutics, a clinical stage company creating novel medicines targeting G-protein coupled receptors. She served as Chief Scientific Officer for, of Heptaris for 12 years, and when Sosei, a phar- biopharmaceutical company originating from Japan, but with global presence, acquired Heptaris, she continued to serve as Executive Vice President, Chief Scientific Officer before joining MSD Merck. Join me and learn more about Fiona's fascinating career and how her work changed the landscape of the GPCR field. Before we jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know that our December newsletter will soon be available. And now, let's dive into our chat with Fiona. Uh, this is Yamina Brashish, founder of Dr. GPCR. Welcome to another episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. I would like to introduce you to my guest. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Fiona Marshall. Hi, Fiona. Hello, Hello everybody. I'm very pleased. Always happy to talk about GPCRs. Great to have you on the show. So um, uh, how are you doing with, with this whole uh, new era that we live in? Oh, it's fine. You know, I prefer meeting people in person, but we've got used to doing everything through uh, Zoom and uh, computer type meetings. And uh, a lot of the work that I do can be done through that medium. So we just have to get on with things and uh, carry on as best that we can. Absolutely. Um, so can you a little bit tell us about, about your career and um, what, what led you in, into getting interested in GPCRs? So um, just a bit about my my sort of background career. I mean, I I grew up in England, although I'm now living in uh, the United States. Uh, I studied biochemistry as my first undergraduate degree. That was at the University of Bath. And then I went to Cambridge to do a PhD. Uh, I did think about doing medicine, but uh, like anybody who is interested in biological sciences, but I decided I'd rather focus on uh, research into the causes of disease uh, and hopefully look for new treatments. And I first became interested in GPCRs during my undergraduate studies at Bath. And I can still actually remember the exact details of when I first heard about GPCRs, which was in a lecture on how the beta adrenergic receptor in the heart is activated by adrenaline, how it then engages the G protein and initiates the whole signaling cascade. And I found it absolutely fascinating and then decided that I would want to work on GPCRs for my PhD. And I wanted to combine that with neuroscience. So uh, I chose to work on uh, neuropeptides that were in the in the basal ganglia uh, that regulate dopamine release. So neuropeptides like uh, CCK and the neurokinins. And then I went straight from my PhD to join what was then called Glaxo, now GSK. And I started working in the neuroscience team there. And that was on a, a lot of different projects, but a lot of them were GPCRs. And uh, that included working on neurokinins in pain, for example, uh, melatonin in circadian rhythms. Uh, After a few years, I moved uh, from the neuroscience group actually into a group entirely focused on GPCRs. That's called receptor systems. And that was at the time of sequencing of the human genome. So in the late 1990s, and the team made many important discoveries in GPCR research then. That included uh, the identification of the heterodimerization of the GABA B receptor. Uh, the team also identified the RAMP proteins that constitute part of the CGRP family of receptors. Wow. And we also identified ligands for a lot of orphan receptors. So that includes the uh, free fatty acid receptors, GPR41 and 43, which are now called FFA3 and FFA2. We also identified the receptor for the nicotinic acid, uh, a drug nicotinic acid, and that's now um, a hydroxycarboxylic acid receptor. 
So many years then uh, working uh, in that area, uh, I then uh, left uh, GSK and spent some time actually working for myself uh, as an independent consultant and sort of back into academia teaching in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that ultimately led me to uh, co-founding Heptaris Therapeutics. Obviously, that's probably what I'm best known for uh, in the GPCR field, uh, now called Sose Heptaris. Uh, and, you know, that was a company entirely focused on GPCRs. And it still is. Um, oh, absolutely. Yes. How, how fun. I think we, a lot of us, a lot of people I speak to, including you and I, um, started working on GPCRs because they attended a, some lecture where exactly. people were, were yes. you know, talking about signaling or, or, or something like that. Um, I don't know if I... If, is your imagination and uh, yeah, you want to know more about it. It does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you had mentioned that you were at GSK. Were you in a large group? Um, how, how was life different um, at a company compared to, to an academic setting during your PhD? Well, my PhD uh, at Cambridge actually was interesting because that was uh, a what's called a case award. So it was in collaboration with industry uh, as actually a company called Park Davis, who went on to be part of Pfizer. So they um, sponsored my PhD at Cambridge. And so I actually split my time. Uh, most of my time was actually spent working, doing my PhD within the company labs. And my supervisor was John Hughes, who's best known for the identification of the encephalin peptides. Uh, and he, so he was my supervisor, although I also had an academic supervisor. So I was really right from the start, very much embedded in that industrial setting and very keen on apply, doing applied research, applying my, my research to drug discovery. So in a way, it was actually quite a natural transition then to move into the team at uh, Glaxo at GSK. And then the next transition, which was almost natural, and correct me if I'm wrong, was the idea of, you know, exploiting GPCRs as drug targets and co-founding Heptaris. Can you tell us a little bit more about the circumstances in which uh, Heptaris was born? Yeah, so this was really based on the work of Chris Tate and Richard Henderson at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, known as the LMB in Cambridge. And they were working for many years. In fact, I collaborated with that group while I was at uh, Glaxo, many years looking at different strategies to try and solve crystal structures of membrane proteins. And, and many of those initially focused on trying to improve expression level. But actually, even when we did that, we got better expression. It still did, the protein still didn't crystallize. So Chris Tate uh, really identified that the problem was the stability of the protein when it was in detergent. And he looked for ways in which you could increase stability uh, through mutagenesis. So that came up with the idea of thermostabilization, that you could introduce mutations into the protein, look at the thermostability in detergent, and if you selected mutations that increase stability, you would get a better protein that could be more easily purified and that would then crystallize. So I uh, was actually at that time working, that was part of the time that I was working for myself as a consultant. And uh, a, a lucky situation is that the venture capital company uh, asked me to go and visit the team at the LMB and see if I thought a company could be formed out of their work. So I went along, uh, spoke to Chris and Richard, uh, and then also Malcolm Weir, I was another person, he was actually at the MRC at that time in MRCT. And between us, we, we just thought it was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, so I wrote a report back to the venture capital company and said I, I recommended funding this company. And then I spoke to Malcolm and, and Chris and Richard and, and said that I would like to join and help set the company up. Wow. What a, what a coincidence. You, you go to meet people and then you end up founding a company. Yeah, it was a great, uh, great sort of co coincidence of the right people at the right time coming together. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Um, so um, at this point, you, you talked, you're, found, you're co-founding Heptaris. You get funding from a venture capital firm. Were there, on the, in the beginning, any challenges that you were facing? And can you tell us more about, about those? Yeah, so, you know, if uh, setting up a new company from scratch is always quite challenging, uh, you need, obviously, you need labs to operate in. The, the benefit we had is that we could use the MRC technology incubator labs. So we're able to use their labs, some of their equipment. 
uh, yes, you have to raise funding and that's not just at the start, but, you know, as you go on, that's one of the main challenges is the, the, the you know, finding uh, sources of funding and then also what is your plan, which choosing which receptors to work on. Uh, and uh, I think we made some very good choices at the start. Um, we, we focused initially on uh, adenosine receptors and also muscarinic receptors. And we were able to solve structures of those um, proteins and use that for structure based design. And those went on to be uh, collaborations with AstraZeneca and with uh, Allergan. So, yeah, the, the initial choice of targets uh, is, is one of the most important things. And then how you can prosecute those and stay ahead. Of course, you've got to then recruit in all the right people. Uh, and, you know, we had a lot of people to try and recruit who, you know, not many people actually had any experience of working in membrane protein structural biology. There was a poor success rate before that. So what we actually did was to bring in people who'd worked in other areas and then we sent them up to the LMB and they worked in Chris Tate's lab uh, for a while to you know, get a better understanding of how to work on membrane proteins. And we recruited you know, chemistry team, not who'd worked on GPCRs, but actually who'd worked on kinases. And you know, we're used to using structures for structure-based design. So you know, bringing all those people together was one of the things that made it work well. That's nice. You had, a, in Chris Tate's lab, you had a pre uh, training to work on GPCRs, which is fantastic. Exactly. And it's not trivial, especially when it comes to crystallizing GPCRs. It, it takes an awful lot of work and an awful lot of time to get these structures. We continued. Another thing that I think which contributed to the success is that we contribute to collaborate with the academic founders, you know, for, for many years. I mean, all through the company, they're still collaborating together. So that meant that we, we, we funded further um, postdocs and PhD students in Chris's lab that could continue to develop the technology. So the technology didn't stand still. It moved on and kept ahead. And of course, the in, initial focus was on X-ray crystallography. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it moved towards doing more on cryo-electron microscopy uh, as another sort of route to getting GPCR structures. And of course, more recently, that has become very, very successful for getting the complexes with G-proteins. Yes, well, la last month, um, as you know, as you might know, I do have um, a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, and we compiled 10 structures that were published only last month. Crystal amazing, structures, crazy. It just has it's, kept on going. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it's been booming, which is, which is great for drug discovery and understanding GPCR function. Exactly. Um, from your experience as a founder, co-founder and CSO uh, of Haptaris, um, were there any lessons that, that you were able to, to learn and take with you on further along in your career? Oh, yes. I mean, I think, you know, the, the main lesson is getting the right team of people together in anything that you do. And I think that applies to any role. And so one of the things I'm doing now is that uh, I was, uh, you know, it's very sad to leave Hectares, but I was recruited to set up a new drug discovery site for Merck or uh, MSD, as they're known outside the U.S., uh, in London and had the opportunity to start from scratch all over again to, to recruit a whole new team to decide on the areas that we could work on. And so a lot of the experience of, of how you can put a team together, getting as diverse a team as possible, with different backgrounds, different perspectives, that I think, would, and how you motivate people to do exciting science, then, you know, that's probably the most important thing that I learned at Hectares that I've tried to take forward to other areas. Wow, that's great. Um, so you mentioned that throughout, through very, very early on in your career, you were uh, introduced to GPCRs and they played a, an important role throughout your career. Um, everyone says, responds yes to this question, but I'm going to ask, ask, you, uh, ask it to you anyway. Do you think GPCRs are still good drug targets? Yes, well, of course, I was asked that many times during the raising of money at uh, Peptaris. And of course, I always said that, and I still do genuinely believe that GPCRs are excellent drug targets. And, and this is for a number of reasons. I mean, one thing that they can be targeted by both small molecules, as well as now increasing antibody therapeutics, uh, obviously being on the cell surface, 
they can be considered quite druggable targets. But you know, having said that, of course, there are some are more difficult to drug than others. Uh, all cells express different sets of GPCRs, and some have got you know unique expression patterns that allows you to target specific cells. And of course, you know, GPCRs play such an important role in so many physiological uh, and pathophysiological processes. So they're implicated in many different diseases. So, you know, immune regulation, metabolic processes, neurotransmission, and, you know, still only around a third of GPCRs are drugged. So, you know, there's a huge opportunity still left. Some might say that when it comes to drugs targeting GPCRs, the low hanging fruit has been picked. What are your thoughts on the most interesting new developments in GPCR drug discovery? Well, so, you know, I think you know, the, the interesting new developments, of course, are still, I'm going to go back to saying the structures, because uh, actually having the structures now is really shedding a lot of new information on how GPCRs operate as a sort of machine, if you like. Yeah. And, you know, I think what was particularly interesting and surprising during my time at Sose Hectares with the new structures were how many compounds were found to bind to unexpected allosteric pockets on the receptor. So, you know, extra helical regions, which we found on the glucagon receptor or C5A antagonists found there or drugs that found on the intracellular side. So those structures are really enabling us to find new ways of drugging GPCRs in different ways, and, and that could be either existing receptors or new receptors. Yeah, another area which I think is quite interesting at the moment is uh, techniques in peptide engineering. I mean, as you know, peptides are often the natural ligands for GPCRs, and peptides can make very good drugs themselves. There's a lot of new developments in how we uh, screen for novel peptide scaffolds, so for example, cyclized peptides. Uh, can be screened using phage display. Uh, and this is a, an interesting way of identifying modulators of GPCRs. And, and also now there are ways of uh, formulating peptides to be orally bioavailable. Uh, so again, it gives you sort of new opportunities. And, and interestingly, even though a receptor, even if it isn't a natural peptide receptor, non-peptide receptors can still, you can still have peptides that bind to them and modulate them. So that's another area which I think is quite interesting. Yes, but one challenge with peptides could be the bioavailability and, and the half half life. What are the methods that are used currently to increase this bioavailability? You mentioned that you could have a drug that's a peptide that you could uh, could take orally. What are people working on right now? Yeah, so you can engineer the peptide itself. That's what I say making cyclized peptides is one. Putting bridge bridges within the peptides. Um, introducing unnatural amino acids or unnatural side chains. So that helps to stabilize peptides, for example, from the natural breakdown mechanisms. But there's also additives that can be given in the formulation that alter the permeation. So they alter the, the gut uh, epithelial and allow more peptides to actually pass through the, the gut wall into the bloodstream. So these are the types of strategies that are being used. All right. Would it be also an option to somehow stabilize a peptide by conjugating it with, with an antibody? Yes, that, that has been done as well. Yes. Great, great. Um, so we've talked about the, the multiple GPCRs that you had worked on. In the current status of GPCR drug discovery, what are the receptors that pharma and biotech are currently focusing on? the most the sexiest ones yeah, so, i mean there, <laughs> there are many gpcrs i think that are uh, still really interesting um you know I, I mentioned gpcrs that are in uh, immune cells and uh, you know, there's a lot of interest really in immunology at the moment because uh, you know immunology is playing a role in so many different diseases we've seen in the oncology area harnessing the immune system but also we now know that in neurodegenerative diseases, the immune system is playing an important protective role. So, you know, GPCRs that regulate immune function, these are things like chemokine receptors, lipid receptors, adenosine as well. Uh, and there's also the MRGX receptors, which are on mast cells. So, you know, I think all of these families are interesting. The other area which are, is, of course has got increasing interest is in GPCRs that are activate, activated by metabolites from the gut microbiome. And I mentioned obviously GPR41 and, and 43 that we originally 
identified or activated by short chain fatty acids. There's also GPR84 and 120 that are activated by long chain fatty acids and ones that are activated by uh, citric acid cycle intermediates like GPR91 and 31. So I think there's a huge area of interesting emerging biology coming out in how the you know, host uh, microbiome interactions may be mediated by GPCRs. So they're certainly some of my sort of favorite ones at the moment. But you know, of course, there's still all these orphan receptors left. And uh, you know, that's another whole area that's uh, you know, really, really interesting. And I sort of feel that there must be something that we're missing that there's still, you know, over a hundred orphan receptors. We don't know what they're doing or what their role is. Yeah, and we're, just, we're still discovering new receptors. Uh, last month, a, a new GPCR was cloned, which um, is not something that you'd see every day. It was more in the 90s and 2000s that all these GPCRs were cloned, but I was, um, I was surprised and happy at the same time to see that there was a new GPCR that was being cloned. And who knows how many other receptors we don't, we haven't yet identified. Exactly. Um, what I wanted also to ask you is, so you, you mentioned all of these GPCRs that are interesting that right now play a role in immunology and oncology um, and, and metabolic diseases. What are the key challenges to drugging these GPCRs? Well, aside from actually for drugging them, you know, a key challenge for drug discovery, not just for GPCRs, is really to study the role of the target in the context of human disease. And, you know, many drugs have failed, including a lot acting through GPCRs, because the validation that we had in animal models didn't translate into efficacy in clinical studies. So, you know, we really need to be much better at studying human biology and human relevant human cells. And, and this is particularly important for GPCRs. For example, it, you know, we're very excited about biased agonism. It's very appealing. But unless you can really confirm what the proper signaling pathway is and the level of coupling in the relevant human cells in the disease tissue, um, you know, you could easily you know, make the wrong judgment about your agonist design. So, you know, that, that for me is the biggest challenge is really understanding human biology. Agreed. Agreed. Especially with now with the biased biased agonists with this whole evolution in the field, people for a long time thought it was one pathway versus the other, and when it turns out that it's it, it's more complicated than that, especially oh, yeah. in a pathological setting, um, and uh, there is a finesse that needs to to be um, to be learned about. So, um, um, agreed. We know we need to know more about the biology and the pathophysiology and the role of GPCRs in, in these diseases, but at the same time, combining that knowledge with getting more crystal structures is uh, a, way, a nice way to combine this information and further develop um, drugs targeting GPCRs in a relevant disease context. What are your thoughts about um, the best way to find allosteric modulators uh, in, in the context of disease um, implicated GPCRs? Yeah, so, I mean, to find allosteric modulators, you have to be very careful how you set your screens up. And, um, you know, ideally you want to run a screen uh, both in the presence uh, of the natural agonist, um, ideally at more than one concentration, because if, if you put in uh, too high a concentration, you might not see a potentiation with an allosteric modulator. So looking at different signaling pathways, having the screen run in the absence of any other agonist, but then in the presence of the natural agonist ligand, uh, you know, these are going to be the best ways of finding allosteric modulators, but also doing very high throughput libraries like DNA encoded libraries on purified proteins uh, that allows you to find binders to the receptors that you might not find in e easily in cell-based assays. And if you can then combine that with getting the structure of those molecules, those allosteric modulators, then you can use structure-based techniques to optimize those. What would be the, I don't want to say the best, but what would be a good, what would a good drug look like? Would it be an agonist, an antagonist, an allosteric modulator? Or, um, well, interestingly, I mean, actually, out of all the GPCR drugs there are at the moment, I did an analysis once, and it's almost exactly 50% agonists and 50% antagonists. <laughs> so they're both good. Uh, of course, there aren't that many allosteric modulator drugs. 
still. Uh, and, you know, I think that's because there are challenges in actually translating the level of allosteric modulation into the clinic. So we still need to do more work on that. But, you know, the best drugs are ones that have really strong validation of the role of the GPCR in the disease and then have all the properties that you need in terms of safety, duration of action, uh, target engagement. And, and a minimal amount of, of side effects that goes with that. Exactly, of course, yes. Um, what are the disease areas where new connections to GPCRs are currently being made? Well, the oncology area is quite interesting because, again, this, this uh, focus on uh, the immuno-oncology area and the role of immune cells uh, allows you to then identify a number of GPCR targets. And so that's, again, the chemokine receptors are being looked at in that context, the denosine receptors, which regulate uh, immune cells. So that's one area of interest. Another one is, um, you know, the proton sensitive uh, GPCRs. So these are activated by changes in pH. They're receptors like GPR4, 65, 68, 132. Um, these have been implicated in tumor growth uh, and in tissue repair. So they're another really quite interesting family. And then, you know, the other the family that we still don't really understand much about are the adhesion receptors. We're starting to know more about the fact that they really are GPCRs. They really do signal to G proteins. And a few now examples of some small molecule modulators have been identified. So I think that's one where there should be increasing knowledge coming out. But those do, again, seem to be potentially involved in oncology and in immune function, um, possibly in development. Yeah, adhesion receptors are very challenging to study to, to start with. Yeah. So um, we, we need to focus more on that. And I recently spoke to a previous guest and we were talking about taste receptors. And I learned that you get you have taste receptors in your gut. Um, potentially, those also may play a role in a metabolic disease or even in cancer. That's right. More work that needs to be done. Um, in the context of, of these GPCRs and in this, these new connections that are made, especially in cancer and oncology, um, there seems to be a disconnect between, let's say, the GPCR world and the cancer world. And there is a need to better understand the function of GPCRs in the context of cancer. How can we better target these GPCRs in, this immuno in the oncology setting? I think, I think you're right. there definitely was a separation of cancer with GPCRs. I mean, I can remember even when I worked it, uh, at GSK, going to the oncology people and pointing out to them that GPCRs could be interesting targets. And this I'm talking about 20 years ago now. And they were like, no, 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 we're not interested in GPCRs because they're very focused on intracellular signaling at that time within the tumour. Uh, but I think now that oncology is thought of more broadly in the tumour environment with all the different cells that are in the tumour uh, milieu, so not just the tumour cells, but also the other immune cells, I think GPCRs are becoming uh, of more, a much more interest uh, in, to cancer biologists. And of course, they are also on tumours and they are upregulated. So ways where you're looking for targeting the immune cells to the tumour GPCRs can act as a, a point of interaction there as well. Definitely. Do you think the lack of interest in the beginning from cancer biologists towards GPCRs was the fact that in many cases the receptors are rarely mutated in cancer, but they're uh, overexpressed? Yeah, they're not oncogenic. Yeah, they can be abnormally expressed. Um, but also GPCRs tend to be more modulatory, I would say. Um, you know, at the time, uh, cancer biologists were looking for targets within tumor cells that would kill the tumor cell. And normally a GPCR drug won't do that. Um, it might increase proliferation or slow down proliferation, but not usually trigger um, cell death. So that, that was really one of the reasons why there wasn't that interest. But I think now you can see that enhancing immune cell function allows you to then kill tumors. And so that's the route in through the GPCRs. And also the availability of, of new antibodies and new ways to quantify these receptors and show that they're overexpressed either in the cancer or in the cancer environment as well also helps um, make that connection of GPCRs and cancer. Yes, I think you're right. I mean, the, this, this idea about 
you know, really studying human cells and human tissue applies to all different disease areas. And one technique that we're using more and more now is single cell RNA sequencing uh, and really getting at the expression profiling at the cellular level. Uh, you do still have to check that the protein is there uh, or not. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes there can be a disconnect between the RNA presence and protein for uh, GPCRs. So because sometimes they're expressed for quite a long time at the cell surface, so the levels of RNA can be quite low, even though the receptor protein is actually there. So you mentioned uh, single cell RNA sequencing, which is a nice tool to better understand the expression profile of GPCRs, for example, in, in cancer cells. What are the other tools or initiatives that could speed up the identification of GPCRs in the context of cancer, for example? Um, well, I'm going you know, to throw back to the context of neuroscience, which is my area, some of the te techniques that we're using. So uh, there, um, you know, we're using, again, hu trying to get human tissue. The nice thing about cancer is you actually have human tumor cells that are taken out of patients and you can study those. So that's very useful. That's much more difficult in the case of neuroscience and Alzheimer's. You don't usually get bits of brain tissue that you can use. So what's really helped us there is being able to use iPS cells that are being differentiated into different neuronal populations like dopaminergic neurons, for example. And you can derive those iPS cells for, from patients who have genetic forms of the disease. So inherited forms of Parkinson's disease, for example. And then you can actually study your GPCRs on those cells and, and how they signal. So that gives you, uh, a, you know, a different strategy for validating uh, the target biology. Great. I think having these iPS cells and being able to differentiate them, especially from patients, could be really the best and most direct context in which you can study a, the function of a GPCR in a disease setting at this moment. Um, what are other key informations that are missing that would help GPCR drug discovery? So today we can, you know, crystallize fairly easily compared to 20 years ago GPCRs. We have all these models. We have great tools to do virtual screens, to do HTS screens very, very quickly and very fast. And we have all these libraries. Are there, is there any key information that's missing to help well, us move if forward? If I go back to the orphan receptors, we're still totally missing mm -hmm. what over 100 receptors actually do, and what their ligands are, how they signal, uh, how they're behaving. And so, you know, there's a huge amount of work still for, for people to do to unravel these. I think, you know, before we used to have to do knockouts and almost all of these orphans have been knocked out, but then you don't necessarily see an obvious um, phenotype uh, in the knockouts. So then it makes it harder to link those to disease. Uh, what you need to then do is look in, in more careful detail at different tissues and see what, map, you know, map different changes. Again, you can use things like RNA sequencing and high throughput proteomic techniques uh, to look for changes as a result of uh, changes in these, the expression of these GPCRs. So that's maybe one thing that will help us to link these orphans to diseases. Since there is so much more to do and so much work to do to help drug GPCRs in many di different disease contexts, what would be your advice to junior scientists who are aspiring to, to help improve GPCR drug ability and understand GPCR biology in general? Well, I'd say jump right in because, uh, you know, there's plenty to be doing. And I think, you know, people need to think about what excites you most in the area. Um, you know, are you interested in the disease aspects? Are, there, are you interested in new technologies, technology development? It's important, of course, to find good mentors uh, who can help you. Um, and you know do that by networking as much as you can uh you know for example going to conferences and joining webexes so you know at the end of the day you've, you've just got to do a lot of hard work and do a lot of reading and that's what helps you know you come up with ideas and sometimes be a little bit lucky and meet, meet the right people of course that that's always right helps people. um it's a good time right now although we're living in an un uh, totally new uh new world but it's a good time to go to meetings there is plenty of virtual meetings virtual summits where you can very easily get access to it and it kind of you know um 
disrupts that barrier of having to travel to to a space to a new spot to to meet people so i think it's a it's a good time for for to do that especially networking yeah. online um so what would be your advice to someone or a gpcr scientist who has an idea and would like to turn it into a company into a product to help improve human health well again it's going around and talking to the right people so try and connect with people who uh, have set up companies before and initially really try and work on a, a good plan business plan of, of how you would take that product forward you know what how is it going to be unique from what other people are doing what do you actually need to get to that how many people would you need to recruit for example uh, is it something that you can do work through contract research companies so be like a semi-virtual company so you need to have a good uh, sort of scientific plan but also a business plan and then you know start to go and, and talk to people that have set up companies already at some point then you would go and speak to usually a, a start early investor that found startup companies quite often for people who are in universities they have uh, advisors that can help they can be in the tech transfer offices for example uh, or they have entrepreneurs in residence that you can go and speak to um, to get help uh, and then you know then you can just just get started there are more and more uh, incubator spaces that just pop up everywhere. So that's also a way to, um, to try to get, for example, lab access if you don't have a university lab already. Yeah. Um, you've worked on so many GPCR related projects, GPCRs. What were your um, aha moments as a scientist that kind of shaped your trajectory or your refocus your interest on one GPCR versus another? I mean, I think, you know, the first aha was actually, funnily enough, it was actually while I was away on maternity leave, having a baby, I'd left, I was in the neuroscience group, but while I was away, there was a reorganization in the department. And when I came back, that's when I had the opportunity to join the receptor systems team and focus on the cloning and identification of GPCRs. And, you know, that led to a lot of the work and particularly you know, the GABA B heterodimer identification was a, was a perfect aha because we knew that uh, we'd actually cloned a receptor, uh, but we didn't really know what it was doing. Uh, and the, the first GABA B receptor, which is now called GABA B1, we tried to express it and get it to signal. It just didn't work at all. So we were looking for some interacting accessory protein that we thought would help it. And we ran a screen to look for that. And then we pulled out the other GABA-B partner, the GABA-B2 receptor. And so when we were looking, literally looking down the list of the partners that we pulled out on that screen, a lot of them were intracellular proteins, like you might expect, scaffolding proteins, this sort of thing. But then just literally looking down the list, there on the list was the, the second GABA-B receptor. And so that was like a real aha, but then it was made better because we immediately thought, oh, this could be a, a heterodimer. And that was before any other heterodimers had been identified. So we did the classic experiment in Xenopus oocytes, where you inject the cDNA of both the receptors together. And we did that. And I was in the room when we then added on baclofen, the agonist, and we could see the uh, ion channel activation. So that was a, a great science aha. And um, it did make, I did then spend quite a long time working on GABA B as a drug target, but that never actually worked out because we thought there were going to be lots of sub, uh, subtypes, which there are for the metabotropic glutamate receptors. We thought there would be multiple metabotropic GABAergic receptors, but in fact there weren't. And so it was very difficult to get a drug that didn't have side effects. So that was one aha moment. Obviously, I told you the other one, which was when I went to the LMB and met Chris Tate and Richard Henderson. Uh, and that sort of seeing their technology, I, I knew that would make a good company. And, and, you know, when all the time I was, at, you know, so say hectares, we had many, many ahas every time we got a new structure. And it was particularly exciting when we got the first class B receptor structure, which was the CRF1. You know, nobody had ever seen a class B receptor before. And we had this really cool room where you could see. Uh, you could put on 3D glasses and see the receptor in three dimensions sort of floating in the room and moving around. 
So you could explore it in that uh, context. So that was, you know, a fantastic, uh, fun time uh, in my career. A little bit out of a movie. <laughs> it was, yeah. And uh, the, G the GABA B receptors were one of the first receptors I studied. And um, I haven't worked directly on them, but learning about them, I thought it was a really neat system that you actually yeah. needed the second partner to, to get on the surface and to signal. Yes. A really cool, really neat system. Were there any yeah. other moments that you thought were worth mentioning today? Yeah, there, there are so many. I mean, some other ones was when we were trying to find the ligands for the free fatty acid receptors. And uh, we were screening those in yeast cells because they don't have a background. So they're quite a clean system. And we thought they were peptide receptors. So we were trying to screen peptide libraries. And we got some peptides that activated them. So we got very excited. Then we tried to make lots of peptide analogs to get SAR. And it just made no sense. Some peptides were active, some were not active. It was very crazy. And then Andrew Brown, who was uh, the person who was in the lab doing it, he just sat down with a table of what was active or inactive. And then he realized that the peptides that had been dissolved in acetic acid or acetate were the ones that were active. And the ones that were dissolved in something else, the ones that were just used as basic ones, were inactive. So it turned out that the ligands were not the peptides at all. It was the acetic acetate. And then, of course, that became the acetate and butyrate activated receptors. So that was another fun aha moment. That's, that's really neat when you have to go back and look at what, what is your receptor we suspended in and realize that actually it's not the peptide. Exactly. Just the basic conditions of the assay. <laughs> Phenomenal. Um, before I let you go, I want to ask you one last question. Um, this is a topic that has come up lately. Unfortunately, we, we have to talk about this uh, in 2020, but what are your thoughts on increasing diversity in the field, not only in an academic setting, but also in a biotech and biopharma setting? Well, you know, first of all, it's so important that we do increase diversity in, in all its forms, you know, gender, Uh, race, culture, etc. Because, you know, I, I really know from my own experience that if you can put together a diverse team, you get a much more productive and happy team. Uh, if you get people, the, the problems we're trying to solve in science are really difficult and complicated and they're not obvious. And everybody comes with a different perspective and a different way of thinking about it. So the more that you can get people with diverse attitudes and backgrounds and diverse ways of thinking about things the more likely you are to come up with good ideas or ways of solving problems so how can we actually do this well you know i think one way is to try and have more role models uh, that can set good examples and i think you know we've done pretty well in the sort of getting a better gender balance uh, in the field and that's because there have been you know, good women who've been, you know, leading labs and setting examples. So I think we should be able to do that, uh, you know, in, in other aspects of diversity. But, you know, it does fall down to people who are organizing conferences to really make sure they have the best possible diverse uh, speakers, not just the same people who are there over and over again. I mean, the, the slightly disappointing thing is having worked in GPCRs for 30 years, and I look at the conferences, the same people are speaking now as were speaking 25 years ago. So can we now try and encourage the next cohort of people to be the main speakers at conferences? I think it's so important. And, um, you know, people should actually, the, the old guard should decline to be speakers and actually put forward younger people from their labs to, to represent them and speak about their lab work. You know, it's la important for lab heads and anybody who's got the responsibility to recruit people to make sure that they try and find uh, uh, diverse groups uh, for their own labs and then mentor those people as best that they can and promote them. So I think that has to come from partly from the top down, um, Um, and, you know, people from diverse backgrounds hopefully should start to feel more empowered that they can go out and search for opportunities and, and contact people and just say, here I am, this is what I have to offer. You've touched on a very important point talking about mentorship. I think mentorship is very important at all levels and having, making sure that people who work with you or for you feel supported, but at the same time, as a mentee, 
being able to ask for help and to reach out um, is very important as well. And you write about the conferences. Is, you look at the programs, it's always the same people. And uh, that's why we're organizing uh, with Dr. GPCR a, a new GPCR virtual summit where um, anyone can submit an abstract and anyone can uh, come in and make a presentation. And I'm encouraging a lot of PhDs and postdocs to, to come in and, um, and present their work. And even on the podcast, we're looking at uh, having more postdocs come on in and uh, present and talk to us about their work that they're doing because they're the ones who are at the bench doing the heavy lifting. No, that's great. I think that's a fantastic idea. It's, uh... Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fiona, for your time. I Thank really appreciate you, it. I really enjoyed talking to you and uh, I love the uh, Dr. GPCR uh, website and the podcast. It's a great idea and I, I hope it will stimulate more and more people to work in this field. I really hope so. Uh, my, my goal uh, is to have as many people as possible reach out to us, have us uh, contact us and so that we can all be under the same umbrella. And if anyone needs any help, whether it from biotech or ac academia, we can work together. You mentioned previously that at Heptaris, you maintain this close collaboration with academics and you kind of co -ev -ev um, um, uh, evolved uh, during, during that time and you're still doing it and that is amazing and that's important. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, bye. Thank you for listening to this special Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We really hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the podcast where you listen to podcasts. I'd like to thank Dr. Fiona Marshall, Attila Forrest, Jin Chong, and Shivani Sachdev. Music by Rosa Bershish. I am your host, Dr. Yamina Bershish. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And until next time, stay safe.